All right, you can turn in your King James Bible to Revelation chapter 20. We're back to the studies, uh, looking for things that we can learn today for Bible-believing Christians, instruction and righteousness for us today uh, from the book of Revelation. It's a very interesting study, and um, I'm going to show you some neat things today in this one. But um, we're going to start here in verse 1. It says here, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, where would John have to be in order to make that first statement there? I saw an angel come down from heaven. He's on the earth. He sees an angel come down from heaven. Look over at chapter 19, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. In the future, saints in heaven are, we are in heaven throughout the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, plenty of studies to prove that. And we're up there, the marriage happens, and we get mounted on horseback, and we come with Jesus Christ to the battle of Armageddon. He does all the fighting. We follow him to Jerusalem. Okay, and then we have the marriage supper on the earth. I'm going to prove this to you here in just a little bit. But we come down. Okay, we go up before the time of Jacob's trouble. The body of Christ is in heaven in Revelation chapter 5. You read about the 24 elders and then a great number of angels. In the resurrection we are as the angels of, of God. So the body of Christ is in heaven uh, before the first seal is opened in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And we are there throughout that time of Jacob's trouble. God's dealing with you know, the nation of Israel. That's the whole point of the book of Revelation. He's revealing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right? Signs and wonders are being given to the nation of Israel to show them, hey, you messed up. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that today as we continue. But... Just an interesting thing. If you want to go to Jude, right before the book of Revelation, you have a little book called Jude. Jude chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Let's read that. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He's coming with his saints. All right. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly, among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So the people that survived this time of Jacob's trouble, uh, wrongly called the Great Tribulation, but you know that's another issue. But the people that survive this time are going to be judged by redeemed Christians. We're going to see that later on too. It's a, going to be a lot of scriptures today. But you can go back to Revelation chapter 20. Verse 2 says here, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now when does this event take place? This angel comes down from heaven, and he lays hold on the dragon, which is the devil and Satan. You know, it's clearly showing you who this is. Grabs him and puts this chain on him. When does that happen? Go back to Matthew chapter 22. I want to show you when this event takes place. It happens at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a mar marriage for his son. Every time you see the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew is the only time it appears in the King James Bible. Kingdom of heaven is always, 100% of the time, a reference to the physical, visible kingdom on the earth. Right? It has nothing to do with heaven where God is at. All right. Very important to understand that. You can read Matthew chapter 11. Uh, I think it's verse 12. Let me just look real quick. Matthew chapter 11. Yeah, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay? It has nothing to do with where God is at in heaven heaven. It's a physical kingdom on the earth. Again, we'll be talking more about that. Okay, uh, verse 3, Matthew chapter 22, verse 3, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying to them which, were, which are bidden, 
Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. Hmm. It's talking about the Lord coming to the Jews, and he came to his own, and his own received him not. Okay, uh, verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Um, what group of people has a specific city? The Jews. The city of Jerusalem. Very interesting. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. They rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Now, some Jews do get saved. Praise the Lord for those that do. But the nation of Israel as a whole has rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. God's wrath is coming upon the nation of Israel. Um, I'm glad I'm not a Jew. I'm glad I'm a Christian. Okay, I find it very funny that all these different people, you got the uh, black people trying to call themselves Jews, and you get white racists calling, calling themselves the replaced Israel and stuff like this. We're the Jews now. Um, if you're the Jews, you need to understand that God's wrath is coming upon you. You know, think that one through, okay? I'm a Christian. I escape the wrath to come. But if you say, well, no, actually, I'm a Jew now. Uh, we're the true Jews. The people over there in Israel, they're not really Jews. Okay, um, then God's wrath is coming to you. Uh, no, God's wrath is coming to the people in Israel. And He's going to be revealing His Word to them because they're going to be able to go page by page and event by event in the book of Revelation in the future. All right, look at verse 9. Uh, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He's not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, in other words. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. It's kind of funny because right now, Revelation chapter 12 talks about it. And we're going to be hitting this verse in a little bit. But Revelation chapter 12 talks about it, that the devil is the accuser of the brethren and accuses us before the throne day and night. He's got plenty to say right now. But here he's uh, speechless. Verse 12. Verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So that's when that event takes place there. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. I'm going to go to verse 3. Cast him into outer darkness, we read in Matthew 22. Revelation 20 verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Speechless. Kind of like that. Shut up, you know. Shut him up. And set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. Hmm. Now there's a bunch of different things that, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at here. But uh, if I have that thing here. Okay, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. You can go there. I'll show you the verse I was talking about earlier. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. All the time the devil's up there right now. And he's trying to see. you got to understand how the universe is run. There's a, there's a system of laws and rules by which a unit, by which... God governs things, okay? And that's why it's so important for you to be a Bible-believing Christian, to understand that there are certain things, uh, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. 
Okay? If you have a righteous nation, God will take it easy on that nation. But when they exalt sin and they, and they do all kinds of wicked things, then the devil comes up and he goes, Hey, see? See what America's doing? See what England's doing? See what Australia's doing? See what Germany's doing? See what Spain's doing? Whatever. You see that? What are you going to do about that? God will act in that situation. All right? A nation that goes against Israel and tries to say Israel has no right to that land and whatever else, they're going to get cut off from God's promises and God's uh, the you know prosperity and things that come to a nation. There are certain laws that this you know universe is governed by. And you can read about those laws in your King James Bible. That's why the devil's up there and he's trying constantly to get people to do certain things in a nation so that God will curse that nation. And he tries to mess with you as a Christian so that he can come before the Lord and he can say, hey, look what that Christian did. Look, you know, he did, they did that. Now you're going to let them get away with that? See? That's what he does all the time. <laughs> but when he goes down there, when he's cast down to the earth, halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble, and then by the end of the thing, he's, you know, hiding and stuff like this from the, from the judgment of God, the wrath of God that's coming. And he, he tries to sneak into the marriage supper, you know, I guess trying to get into the millennial kingdom. And the Lord says, there he is, get him, you know, shut him up, you know, and he's speechless. And it's kind of interesting when you think about it, uh, who are the most dangerous people in history? You know, if you would list the top 10 most dangerous men, well, a lot of people would say Hitler would be one of them, or maybe Stalin or Lenin or Mao Zedong or some of these different guys, um, what did they do? How many people did they physically kill themselves? With a gun or their fists or a knife or whatever? You know, you look at a serial killer and you say, that serial killer was a terrible guy. He killed like 17 people before they finally caught him. That's a lot of people. But it's nothing compared to some guy that kills with his mouth. Hitler stands up and he gives his speeches and things like this and gets the German people all riled up and things and they go off to war and they putting people in the camps and stuff like that, torturing people to death. The Pope lets us start crusades, Muslim imams and stuff like this. The people doing the speaking rarely ever do any physical killing. But through their words, they get a lot of people killed. Uh, that's because they're of their father, the devil. Again, we're going to see more on that in just a little bit. All this stuff ties together. It's pretty amazing. But now the question is, it says here, cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. So the question comes up, why doesn't the Lord just at this point just send him into the lake of fire? Well, because man thinks that if we could just achieve a perfect world with perfect climate, no crime, perfect everything, then somehow man wouldn't need God. That would mean that man is able to finally experience his true self or something like this. Uh, no. You're going to see, you know, like I said again as we continue in this study, that man always fails. Even when everything is provided for man and everything is really, really good, man still fails. Let me show you why. Romans chapter 3. You know, people read the Bible and they say there's an awful lot of killing in there and there's all this blood and everything else. Uh, yeah, that's true. You say, well, how could you follow such an evil book? Because this book tells the truth about man. This book presents man as a failure and God as the only answer. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and He's perfect. And man, what does man do to this perfect Savior? They frame Him, they lie about Him, and they murder Him. Man is corrupt. Here's what God thinks of man. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. As it is written, it's referring back to the Old Testament, which we're going to look about here in a minute. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. 
Their throat is an open sepulcher. How's that for a nice picture for you? With their tongues they have used deceit. Remember how many people get killed by these guys like Hitler or the Pope or one of these others? The poison of asps is under their, lisp, their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Hmm. Fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's see where this quotation comes from. Go back to Psalm, book of Psalms, Psalm 14. We'll go back there to the Old Testament. Whenever you see it in the New Testament that says, It is written, that's a, a quotation of the Old Testament. Quoting Hebrew scriptures, but yet translated into Greek. They say no translation can be inspired. Well, I beg to differ. And there's plenty of times in the New Testament where it's written in Greek, and yet they're speaking in Hebrew in the passage. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are, they are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Uh, God doesn't think too much of you. Or me. So you think I'm, I'm somehow, you know, escaping this thing and I'm, well, he thinks he's a good guy. Oh, no, I don't. I think I'm pretty much rotten. Uh, that's why I got saved, you see. That's why I put my faith in Jesus Christ, because I realize there's nothing here that's good. But, oh, how the atheists try. Oh, I'm not such a bad person. How dare that, that horrible God say these things about me? God knows all your secrets. He knows every thought you've ever thought. And if he aired it out for everybody to see, you wouldn't be such a good person, would you? Well, I'm better than Hitler. <laughs> you know. <laughs> sure you are. Mm -hmm. Are you better than Jesus Christ? If you're better than Jesus Christ, then you don't need him as your Savior. If you can live that perfect life without messing up at all, then you don't need Jesus. But if you're real with yourself, if you're honest, then you realize, uh, I need Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Now, there's a whole lot of things in this verse that we're going to be covering. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay. Point number one. Christians will be the ones judging the world during the millennial kingdom. See that in the first part there. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. There's a colon. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Okay? So it's not just saints from the time of Jacob's trouble that were beheaded and things, and they're the ones that rule and reign with Jesus Christ. I do believe that they'll have some kind of reign there. But true millennial rule and judgment and things is for Christians that suffered for Jesus Christ in this life. Let me show you that. Revelation chapter 5. Go to Revelation 5. Verses 9 and 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. These are not Old Testament Jews. Okay? Uh, those that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb out of every kindred, people, tongue, and nation. Uh, excuse me, every tongue, kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. I'll get the order right. Those are Christians. Okay? Look at verse 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Kings and priests. You'll reign on the earth. You say, how do you know that that's Christians? 
Very simple. Turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So the denying in verse 12 there is saying you're going to be denied millennial reign. Okay? It's important to you know understand that. He's not denying you in the sense of, depart from me, I never knew you. You, know, you didn't make it or something because you didn't work hard enough to be saved. You didn't obey or something like this. No. If you're saved, you have eternal life. You're not going to lose it. Okay, it's God's gift to you. Right? He saves you. You don't save yourself by your own works. All right? But notice it says in verse 12, if we suffer, there's a condition there. It's a Bible if. It's a conditional clause. If we suffer. It doesn't say, and we know that we shall reign with him. No, it says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. All right? And you say, well, how do I suffer? Do I have to like hit myself or some other kind of Catholic thing or whatever? No, no. Um, just live by the Bible, read the Bible, and try to tell people about the Bible, and the suffering will come naturally. Okay? You don't have to try to suffer for Jesus Christ. Uh, it's pretty much automatic. <laughs> okay? Um, number two, the point number two of Revelation chapter 20 is that people are beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God. Go to Revelation 5, excuse me, Revelation 6, 9. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the, soul, the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. All right. I've made this point many times before, but I'm going to make it another time, and that is, how can, be, how can people be slain in the future for the Word of God? It's a lowercase w, so you know it's the written Word of God. Capital W is the manifest word. It's a title for Jesus Christ. One of his names appears seven times in your King James Bible, six times in the New Versions, well, the NIV. I don't know about the other ones, but... How can people be slain for the written Word of God in the future if it doesn't exist? So what are you talking about? Well, if you go with the uh, New Version mindset, I'm pointing to the Nestle's text over here, they say, well, the original autographs were the only true Word of God, and, and we just have copies of copies of copies, and no translation can be inspired, and, and, you know, it's just we try to get close with our Greek and our Hebrew as best as we can, but we're always open to new studies, and the Word of God can change at any time, depending on the newest research that we find, and blah, blah, blah. Do um, you think people are going to die for this? How many people in the time of Jacob's trouble do you think are going to be standing around holding up Nestle's texts and saying, you know, yelling out some Greek or something? <laughs> They're not going to do it. Uh, the only people that are going to die for a book are Bible-believing Christians. Study the history of the great Bibles that preceded the King James Bible, and this one too. And look at how many people died, were martyred by the Catholic Church, just slaughtered, you know, just horrible slaughterings by the thousands and thousands and thousands just murdered and murdered and murdered by the Catholic Church throughout the Inquisition period and everything else. And uh, then they come out with their new versions, which the NIV, New American Standard, English Standard Version, if you research where they come from, they come from a different Greek text, totally different Greek text. They're not the same Bibles. Uh, you need to look into that thing. But, and you go back to the Catholic Church, by the way, too. The Nestle's text is used both by the Catholics and by the New Version people. Uh, they don't use the received text, the Textus Receptus that underlies the King James Bible. All right? Um, but here's the whole point. When the rapture happens, only the saved people are going up. And all of a sudden, all those crazy King James-only people, uh, the King James Bible believers... They've gone, and a lot of the New Version people are down here on the earth. Hmm. All of a sudden, you're going to have a bunch of people getting very fanatical about sticking by the book. Turn to Revelation 14. 
Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Who's going to keep the commandments of God? Well, there's people that are very zealous for the truth. And what's going to be the real commandment of God, the big, most important commandment, commandment of God? Well, if you read in verses 9 through 11 there, preceding verse 12, you'll see that if any man takes the mark of the beast and worships the beast in his image, he gets God's wrath. He goes to hell. So, Bible-believing people in the time of Jacob's trouble, you can't really call them Christians because they're not technically part of Christ's body. Christ's body has gone up before the time even starts. But you get people in that time period that are saved are going to have to be very, very radical in their belief of this King James Bible. They're going to be very, very radical to the point of being beheaded for the Word of God. Hmm. It's a rather interesting thing. Go back to Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 4 there. It says about they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Now, Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, definitely says that the mark is in the forehead, in the hand. And I recently saw some crazy guy at this one of these TED Talk things, and he was talking about how that, you know, computer technology is advancing so quickly, and and uh, the only option for the future is, you know, we're going to have to put these chips directly into the brain, you know, and uh, augmented reality and all this other stuff and artificial intelligence in our brains, and and we'll basically create our own god and all this other stuff, you know, yeah, that's what they want to do. So I do believe that there is an implantable chip that's going to go into the actual head. But the whole point is they have digital tattoos. They have all the stuff, uh, QR codes and stuff, the old barcodes, you know, and things like that. They're kind of outdated. They, they really don't work that well, you know. I mean, how many times have you been in the grocery line or some other kind of thing and they're like trying to scan a stupid barcode and it's not working very good? But see, if you have a digital tattoo that can be put upon the forehead... That thing can have all your information in it and whatever else and have little, you know, microfibers and microchips and stuff like that right there. I mean, they're already experimenting with this stuff. They're trying out all kinds of different things. It's kind of like this little tech fair for the Antichrist, Antichrist tech fair, you know, and, and uh, whoever designs the Mark of the Beast technology will get a special prize, you know. Yeah, God's wrath forever and ever. Boy, that was worth it, you know. <laughs> but, uh, Kind of interesting because, um, you know, I do believe the verse here, Revelation 20, verse 4, says, you know, Revelation 13, yes, there's an implantable microchip in the forehead, in the right hand. But this verse clearly says that it's also upon the forehead. What was the church that would, uh, on Ash Wednesday, they would place a mark upon the forehead? And I'll see these goofies going around sometimes, you know, out in public, and they got this black mark upon their forehead. Hmm. Uh, that would be Roman Catholicism. The uh, end times religion. Totalitarian religious system of the Antichrist. They're already given those people a mark upon the forehead. Guy dies and he's, you know, extreme unction and all this stuff, the last rites, and they, they take some holy oil and they go, uh, uh, and they make a cross on the forehead. The Catholics for centuries have already been marked. They're being marked upon the forehead, getting them used to it. And if you want to be a good Catholic, you leave that ash mark on your forehead. And you go around, you do your shopping, you go out in public and stuff, and you got this black mark right there. Yeah. Point number four from verse four. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay. Um, when you just believe the Bible as it is written, there is no other thing and no other system possible than uh, the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. 
they're living and reigning with Christ. And you know, and you say, yeah, well, that just means that they were good Christians. They're with Christ in terms of in fellowship with Christ. Ah, okay. Uh, well, Jesus Christ came down in Revelation chapter 19 to the earth. Uh, where did he go back up before Revelation chapter 20 shows up? Rather stupid. You know, oh, well, the, I, I think that the debate over the, you know, is it post-millennial, amillennial, or, you know, futurism, preterism, um, historic, but, but there's no argument. If you just read the Bible and, and believe what you're reading, people are living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. I mean, just to give you a little thing here, a little, if you don't understand the three different positions, essentially, I mean, you can get all these little twisted other things. Three different positions. Amillennialism teaches there is no millennial kingdom. We're actually in this kingdom age right now. You say, well, who's Christ? You know, Christ is supposed to be on the earth. Who's that? They would say the Pope. I'm not joking. That's what they believe. <laughs> Postmillennialism says, oh, no, actually the church goes through the time of Jacob's trouble, or maybe they not even say that now. They just go and then they're, they're there and they just kind of rule, you know, bring in a world peace type of thing, the Christian church. That's right, you actually heard me right. They actually believe the Christian church is going to bring in a thousand years of peace and Jesus shows up at the end of it. <laughs> you know, you're right, you know. I mean, you know, Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and, you know, whatever else, they're going to bring in a thousand years of peace. Okay, yeah. They can't even, you know, you get a bunch of professing Christians together a lot of times, they can't even go for a couple of hours and have peace. Much less a thousand years, you know. It's insane. Premillennial means Jesus comes at the beginning. He's there ruling physically from Jerusalem the whole way through the thing, you know, telling his saints out across the world what to do. And we're saying, yes, sir, carry out the orders. That's what you believe if you can read plain English. All right. Verse 5. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. All right. Now, people will die in the millennial kingdom. All right. The rest of those, the, the, those that die from then on, you know, they won't be resurrected. It's not that they die and go bam and jump right back up again. No. The rest of the dead aren't going to live until the end of the millennial kingdom. Lord's going to resurrect them at that point in time. Okay? But, notice two things here. This is the first resurrection. There's two of them. Two different resurrections. We'll talk about that here as we continue. But, a lot of people, uh, they'll do this thing. They'll say, um, you know, well, you see, the rapture can't be before the tribulation because the first resurrection doesn't happen until verse 5. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. That's the first resurrection. Okay. Um, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay. Um, I mean, if you just want to go ahead and slap your head a while when you think about this. Um, we just read about ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ here in verse 4. Okay, and I gave you the ref references, Revelation chapter 5, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, saying that we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. How can we do that if we're not resurrected until the end of the millennial kingdom? You know, some of these people, you know, I've had, I mean, I've had people, I can't believe the preacher of rapture anymore. Uh, Brian Moonin was one of the ones, and he quoted this right here. You know, the first resurrection isn't until the end of the millennial kingdom. So we can't be resurrected before the tribulation begins. Uh, yeah. No, the first resurrection has multiple parts to it. Okay. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I mean, you'd think if people just read the Bible, you know, talking about ruling and reigning with Christ, who's that talking about? You know, verse 4, Revelation 20, verse 4, Ruling and reigning with Christ. Verse 5, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. They say, see, nobody's resurrected. Nobody's ruling with Jesus Christ until the thousand years are finished. <laughs> oh, boy. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
people wonder why I get sarcastic. You know, it's just like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. But now as Christ risen from the dead, he went up, didn't he? And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's why Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. Okay. Uh, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Okay. Three basic parts to it. Okay. Christ the first fruits. When he comes up, you read, you know, Matthew chapter 28, there are saints, many of the saints of the Old Testament, or excuse me, many of the bodies of the Old Testament saints arose and came out of the graves and were walking around and people were going, whoa, isn't that, you know, people from the Old Testament? Yeah. So the resurrection of the Old Testament saints already happened. He led captivity captive. He took them up from Abraham's bosom. They were down there waiting. They couldn't go directly to heaven because the blood hadn't been shed yet for them in terms of the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. Their sins were paid for as far as animal sacrifices and things like that. They followed the laws of Moses, but they weren't taken away until Jesus Christ died on the cross and his perfect blood took their sins away. They went up. If you died right now and you went up to heaven or if the Lord said, okay, come on up here to heaven, you're going to look around you're going to see the Old Testament saints there. right? And the souls of those in the body of Christ, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord, the souls are up there as well, waiting for the bodies, to the incorruptible bodies, to join them at the rapture. Okay? So you have Christ, Christ the first fruits, Old Testament saints. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, coming again to receive his bride. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together uh, to meet them in the clouds. Okay? Boom. Old Testament saints. Christians. Then cometh the end when he shall de have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Saints that, that die in the time of Jacob's trouble there. All right? And then, of course, in the millennial kingdom, those people that die, they get resurrected at the end. That's the first resurrection. Okay? It has, essentially, you could say three parts, but it's actually four there because there's a you know, resurrection at the end of the thing. They live not again until the thousand years are finished. All right, but I want to point out something here because again, people say, "Well, you know, Jesus Christ can't be God the Father because he, you know He delivers up the kingdom to God the Father." Okay, well, as I've said in other studies, Jesus as the body is here on the earth; God as the soul is in heaven. All right, we're going to see that here in just a little bit. All right, while Jesus is ruling physically down here on the earth, His soul—I mean, it's not like He just, you know, you you. Go up to, you know, somebody walks up into heaven during the millennial kingdom and there's a little, you know, uh, sign there, a little, little card on the throne and it says, be back in a thousand years. You know, no, God the Father is still going to be up there in heaven. You say, how does that work? I have no idea. I have no idea. Great is the mystery of godliness. You see, if I could explain it all, then that would kind of, kind of contradict scripture. All right. But let's continue here. Uh, verse 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 25. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Notice it says there he must reign. Unless you're post-millennial. Then Jesus Christ doesn't get the rule. He doesn't get the thousand year kingdom on this earth. That was promised to him. He doesn't get it. The church gets it. And if you're all millennial, well, then the Pope gets it. You know, for the last 2,000 something years. You know, it's kind of weird. Uh, any system but premillennialism is satanic because they're trying to take the reign away from Jesus Christ. Your scripture here says, 1 Corinthians 15 25, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The Bible talks about. You know, the heathen, the nations, and things are going to be his footstool. It's a promise. Jesus Christ is going to get millennial reign. He's going to rule this earth for a thousand years. All right. 
back to Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Again, showing we are reigning with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Not we are reigning in the spirit of Christ. No, he's on the earth, physically on the earth. But uh, it says there, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On, second, on such the second death hath no power. The second death is a reference to the other resurrection. Let me show you that. Uh, John chapter 5. You can turn your Bible to John chapter 5. I'm going to show you that there are two resurrections. John chapter 5, verse... There it is. Verse uh, 28 and 29. Okay, it says here, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. All that are in the graves. Look at verse 29. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Okay, two resurrections mentioned there. Go to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, verses 14 through 15. Okay. This is when Paul's on trial. And he says here, verse 14, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Okay. And, they, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, and unjust. Hmm. So, Jesus mentions it, and Paul mentions it. There are two resurrections. Make sure that you show up at the right one. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. Verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Uh, you know, again, it's just so interesting when you read through the, you know, like the book of Job and, and uh, you see the devil having to come and present himself before the Lord. Here, he's down there, you know, speechless. He's been shut up for a thousand years, you know. Doesn't even try to escape. You know, it's like, you know, when you realize the awesome power of God, it isn't some kind of this little cartoonish thing that I always like to rip on of, you know, the devil's down in hell on his throne and he's fighting against God and they're, they're mortal enemies and they fight. The devil's just some kind of little lackey and he has to come get permission to do anything. And the Lord says, down there a thousand years, doesn't even try to escape. Couldn't if he wanted to, you know, but doesn't even try to escape. Do you realize how powerful God is? Do you realize how much we shouldn't fear the devil? We should resist him and he'll flee from you? Huh. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Verse 8, Revelation 20, verse 8. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea goes out there and uh, uses his speech, his mouth, starts opening up again. Now you would think that people that have been there for a thousand years and enjoyed all the things, I mean, you, you know, I did a study the one time on the, the promises of the thousand years. I mean, it's just like the animals are getting along and there's all kinds of gardening happening and, and you know, no pollution, no crime, no, I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful time period, a thousand years of that. 1,000 years. I'm 42 years old and I feel like such an old man, you know, sometimes. I just like, I think about, you know, man, I remember when things used to be this way and that and whatever else. I was born in 1975 and, 
And, you know, the world has changed so much. And I think 1,000 years? What would that be like? My grandmother recently turned 100 years old just this past month. And I'm thinking, man, you know, 100 years old, that's, that's really old. Uh, that's one-tenth of what we will be experiencing in the Millennial Kingdom. Incredible. And even after all of that, even after all of that, the devil can go out and just start talking to people and deceive them. The pen is mightier than the sword. Do you ever hear that? You can do a lot with your mouth. Hmm. Verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus Christ on the earth, God the Father in heaven. Fire comes down from God and devours them. Rather interesting. But uh, it says their beloved city. Where's this beloved city at? Excuse me. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 34 through 35. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Hmm. God's in heaven. Look at verse 35 nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Hmm. The beloved city. Is it a beloved city right now? No. No, the Pope is fighting with their, you know, uh, scheming behind the scenes and stuff. The Roman Catholics are scheming behind the scenes to basically uh, take over the city of Jerusalem. I mean, they pretty much already have. It's an international city and things like this. Um, that's where the Antichrist is going to be ruling and reigning from. Why? Well, he wants to imitate God. That's why. Uh, the devil's going to try to take that city. Hmm. But isn't that interesting? I read that earlier about God the Father in heaven, Jesus on the earth. And right there you have it. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Wait a second, though. Okay? This has to be a contradiction, you see, because Jesus is on the earth for the millennial kingdom, right? Sure he is. Um, God is up in heaven. Jesus delivers the kingdom to his Father in heaven, right? Verse 34 here. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne... God's throne. Okay, who's, who's in heaven? God the Father, right? Verse 35, Nor by the earth, for it is Jesus' footstool. Uh, no, it says His footstool. Who's the His? God the Father. You say, wait a second. I thought God the Father's in heaven. How could He also be on the earth? Mystery of godliness. Got you again. <laughs> Jesus is on the earth. God the Father in heaven, and yet it's God the Father's throne up there, neither by the earth nor by the earth. It is His footstool. They're one and the same. So shocking, isn't it? I mean, what are, what are you going to do with the councils and the, tra the, the all the things and the church fathers' writings and all the different special stuff that have Jesus and God the Father as two separate you know, beings? What are you going to do with all that stuff? I mean, you can't contradict that and be a good Christian, can you? Any day of the week. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can, I'm so concerned when I, when I, you know, speak against church councils and church fathers and all the other stuff, you know. <laughs> I mean, I just, I lose sleep about it, you know. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. I'll stick with the book. Let's continue. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's going to be fun to watch. But notice there, if you look at verse 10, you go to Revelation chapter 
19, verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Chapter 20, verse 10, where the beast and the false prophet are. Oh, wait a second, though. Hell is just separation from God. It's the grave. Uh, you don't burn in the grave, okay? No, it's a lake of fire, right? Hell, I believe, you know, is the temporary place right now, but then it turns into the lake of fire. But notice that the Antichrist, the beast there, and the false prophet are in the lake of fire for 1,000 years before Satan goes down and joins them, the unholy trinity. You know, they're together finally, you know. It's kind of funny, too, because the, the beast and the false prophet, I believe, are men. I believe that, you know, the body of the beast is used by Satan, basically possessed by Satan. Uh, but, you know, when times get rough, the devil goes whoop, and runs off and leaves those two guys to take the heat, literally to take the heat. But he joins them a thousand years later. And they're still burning. You get that? They're still burning after a thousand years. Oh, it's annihilation. No, it isn't. The Bible plainly teaches, if you just can read again, just read plain English, the Bible teaches that torment in hell is forever and ever and ever. It never ends. I've heard it said this way, you know, it'll end when God ends. You know, when God dies, hell will just burn itself out or whatever. Problem is that God is the source of eternal life, so he's going to live forever, so you burn in hell forever. So I just can't fathom it. Uh, neither can I. That's why I got saved. I don't want to go through some kind of a thing where I'm burning forever and ever and ever. You say, well, why would a loving God? A loving God provided His Son. Okay? <laughs> Sent His Son down to die on the cross to pay for your sins so you don't have to go to hell. That's love. Don't get me to say, why would a loving God? If you knew what, what all Satan did... You know, Matthew chapter 25 says about the, that this, you know, that hell, the lake of fire and things, is you know, prepared for the devil and his angels. So he finally goes, verse 10 there. Now, let's look at about the uh, second resurrection there. The first resurrection is saved people. The second one is for the lost. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 12. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. According to their works? There's a lot of people that are going to be judged by their works. And that's what they believe. That's the interesting thing. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You'll run into people sometimes and you say, you know, uh, Jesus died for sinners. Are you a sinner? I'm not a bad person. I mean, come, come on. I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've never killed anybody. I don't rob banks or something. You know, I'm, I'm not that bad. You know, I, 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 think that, I think we're all going to get there to heaven and our good works are going to be weighed against our bad works, you know, and stuff. And I, God's cool. I mean, God's, God's not going to just you know, torture people forever. I'm going to be judged according to my works. They're actually prophesying their own doom. If I'm judged by my works, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to be judged according to the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing me from all those sins of my past. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, you see. I don't want to be judged by my works. But let me show you a, a group that will be. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13-15 through 15 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Ready? Whose end shall be according to their works. Say you know, are people going to be judged by their works? Yeah, actually they will be. All these people, don't judge me. I'm not a bad person. Don't judge me. Well, Romans chapter 3, you know, uh, back in the book of Psalms, you know, uh, God thinks you're a bad person. Uh, well, you know, who are you to judge me? Well, you're going to be judged by your works someday. We'll see how good you are. 
I mean, hey, if the Lord finds somebody that you know exceeded the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that was just lived perfectly, even better than Jesus did, I'm sure he'd let them into heaven. But you see, uh, there's not anybody like that. All have sinned. Everybody. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verses 13 through 14. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's kind of interesting because the inhabitants of hell are actually just referred to as death and hell. Just like, you know, God doesn't even look down and say, oh, well, you know, and knows all their names. You know, just, you're, you're just hell now. You know, some people say you look like hell. Uh, well, the people at the Great White Throne Judgment, they will. The dead that died back there in the past that went to hell. If you die right now, you go to hell. Those people, they get up there. Yeah, they are going to look like hell. And God's going to send them to the lake of fire forever. Hmm. An interesting thing there. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What is the book of life? Philippians 4. Verse 3. Look at the first reference to the book of life. Philippians 4, verse 3. Okay. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Okay. So it's obviously clearly saved people that are in the book of life. Go to Revelation chapter 3. The term book of life appears mostly in the book of Revelation. But uh, let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Okay? Now, the theory is there, a lot of people would say that, well, the book of life is actually the Bible itself. I know there's an interesting theory that um, could it be if you go with equidistant letter sequencing and stuff like this, you know, they come up with different names and whatever. I don't know. You know, you take that fourth word, fourth letter of every eighth verse or something, and, and, and you know, of every twelfth chapter or something like this, and it comes up with somebody's name. And and so the theory is, could it be that everybody's name is encoded into the Bible, into the pages of Scripture, from the beginning of time till now? And so when you sin, when you reject Jesus Christ, then your name is blotted out of the book of life. And of course, you get people that change the word of God, that take away from the word of God, and people go, well, then see, they're taking their name out of the book of life. Now, that seems like a plausible theory and things like that, but that's not what's going on here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. You say, why not? Um, who's verse 5 written to? Revelation 3, verse 1, and, in, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis. This is a church a group of people there, the church of Sardis. Okay, It's not talking to lost people. This is talking to saved people. All right. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You say, wait a second here. Um, this is lost people. It can't be. Okay. How do you get saved? By overcoming? No, you get saved by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Well, then... This is talking to a church in Sardis, and if the people don't overcome, the Lord will blot their name out of the book of life. Now, you know, whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So what do you do with this? 
You say, well, these are seven churches in Asia Minor at the time of John writing and stuff like this in the first century. Okay, then there could be Christians, conceivably, that could have their name blotted out of the book of life. I got in all kinds of trouble about this years ago, you know, standing in this very spot here. You know, I didn't have the bookshelf here, but people got all upset with me. And I just said, you know, I'm not sure. It's just like these different things here. You know, I believe in eternal security. I've preached on eternal security. I'm very hardcore eternal security, once saved, always saved, whatever you want to call it. But I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, okay, well, what do you do with this? It's written to a church. It's saying you have to overcome or else your name is going to be blotted out of the book of life. And so you can take it and you can go, well, um, when it says blotted out, that, that could actually just mean that in the sense of your name blotted out of the book of life, it's, it's still there. It's just underneath the whiteout or something. Or you can just believe it as it's stated. Um, why do Christians have to overcome? That sounds like more like people that have to endure to the end to be saved. Matthew 24, verse 13. There's different ways to look at this thing. Now, I would look at this thing and I would say, actually, if you look at some of these seven churches, um, it looks like some of them, there's some stuff written there to people that could be going into that time of Jacob's trouble. Again, I'm not worried about overcoming things. All right. Somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble, they will have to overcome a whole lot of things, you know, to be saved. All right. There's the faith of Jesus, but there's also the thing of you're going to be beheaded if you believe this book and you refuse to take the mark of the beast. You're going to have to overcome. And if you decide to run or whatever else and try to get out into the wilderness someplace, well, that's going to be pretty hard too. They're going to be hunting you down and... You know, even if you can somehow be very evasive, you're still still dealing with a third of the trees being burned up and, you know, animals going crazy and all this other, you know, natural disasters and mega earthquakes and war and everything else. You have to be some real overcoming. And if you don't overcome, your name's going to be blotted out of the book of life in that time period. Now, I believe, you know, doctrinally speaking, that this is talking to a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. I don't believe that this is for Christians. All right. I mean, just look at the thing, you know, if you have a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble, they have their faith in Jesus. They believe the Bible, whatever, but they get weak and they say, you know what? I got it. I, I just can't watch my wife and children starve to death. Um, I have to take the mark, worship the beast and his image. I have to, so that my wife and children can eat. Lord's not going to look and say, well, you know, I did promise that you're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay, I guess I'll make an exception. There are no exceptions. And I believe at that point, that saint in the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe that God goes and just crosses their name right out. He blots that name right out. That's what I believe. Your name's not in the book of life. You're cast in the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 15. Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? So again, people that are not written in the book of life there are those that are taking the mark. All right? Save people, their names written in the book of life. Revelation 17, verse 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou, thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay, so again, these lost people, these recipients of the mark of the beast, their names are not written in the book of life. Very, very clear. The Bible's crystal clear on that, you know, point. If I can turn my notes here. <laughs> trying to do this with one hand. Not going so good. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 27. 
Revelation 21, verse 27 says, And there shall in no wise enter into it, New Jerusalem, um, is what it's talking about, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay? The book of life is extremely important that your name is written in that thing. You know? And again, can a Christian have their name blotted out of the book of life right now? I would say no to that. Uh, why? Well, in context of Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, it's saying we have to overcome or your name is blotted out. Is that really accurate for today? You say, well, no, I don't think so. Well, then are the seven churches really about seven literal churches in, you know, the first century? Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now this thing here will make Christians squirm and squirm and squirm. And it's just like, I just believe the Bible as it's written, brethren. Yes, I do believe in eternal security. I really, truly do. But I'm not going to twist this scripture to try and make it teach somehow eternal security. Um, well, you know, the, the fact that their name is taken out of the book of life, or the parts taken out of the book of life, um, that just means uh, some kind of uh, inheritance or something. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. If your part is taken out of the book of life, that's your name being taken out. Don't even give me that. Oh, it's somehow in just uh, rewards or something like this or whatever else. You know, uh, well, it, you know, it, 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 if you change God's word, if you add to it or subtract from it and then call it God's word or whatever, uh, it's not just misquoting scripture. You know, that's not what's going on here. If you're knowingly changing the word of God, adding to and taking away, you know, from it, uh, if you're doing that, then your part is taken out of the book of life. Okay. Um, and people say, well, then, you know, if you, if you do that, then you were never really saved in the first place then how'd your name get into the book of life? You know, it just... And, you know, some people say, well, is this, you know, for the millennial kingdom? Is it in another dispensation? Because we have eternal security. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Um, so how could you have a sealed Christian that changes Scripture and yet, and then their parts taken out of the book of life? You know, uh, it could be for that millennial kingdom dispensation. Um uh, I understand. I understand the arguments there. Again, people have made it, they've twisted my words and made it like, I, you know, and I made the mistake of way back when thinking that, you know, Stephen Anderson was saved and then he got mixed up and things like that. No, I was wrong on that. I mean, he's convinced me since then that he's always been lost. But, you know, I will say that I believe that changing God's word is very, very dangerous. And again, you know, I'm just going to read it. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not going to change God's book. You say, why? Well, that verse right there says that your part can be taken out of the book of life. So, well, brother, that could be for somebody in the millennial kingdom. I think it's for them, that final dispensation. Okay, but I'm not going to mess with God. I'm not going to mess with His book. There are certain things that make God very angry, and I'm just not going to go there. You know what I mean? You know, I will teach eternal security. I believe in eternal security. Again, people lie about me. It's incredible. You know, I mean... I forget even how much it was. You know, most of the sermon, the original sermon I did, I'm defending eternal security, eternal security, eternal security. And I said, well, this verse here looks like somebody could lose their salvation. You know, being honest. And there are still people today, you know, all oh, you know, the Brian Ellinger fell and stuff like this, and all oh, it's a tragic fall and all this, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's going to be it for Revelation chapter 20. Uh, just wanted to kind of revisit that a little bit. I mean, I'm not going to do a whole study on this whole thing. Um, but, you know, it's it just like there's a couple of things that I know are very near and dear to the Lord's heart. And I'm just I'm just not going to mess with that stuff. And uh, God's word is one of those things that you just don't mess with. And um, so uh, just an interesting chapter, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, definitely proves a bunch of doctrines for us as Christians today. Uh, and the big one is the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, the, the reign of Jesus Christ. 
And um, the way that you get into that thing, brethren, if you remember what we said there in the study, the way you get into that thing is through suffering. And again, I know a lot of you are suffering. Uh, I get plenty of it on in my own life. But uh, be encouraged. I mean, I look out of this world sometimes, you know. Uh, you know, I'm out at the beautiful property the Lord gave us, and I'm, and I'm getting into, you know, building and stuff like that, and it's just like, Look up and they're geoengineering, you know, chemtrailing the living daylights out of the sky. And I, I hear somebody drive by on the street and I hear rock music playing and whatever else. And got to stop at the gas station. And there's rock music playing there and vexation of spirit and everything else. And just like, oh boy. But you know what? Woke up this morning and looked outside and everything was white. Got our first snowfall. <laughs> Most of it's melted by now, but you know. It's all white. God is going to just cleanse this planet. And for 1,000 years, we're going to get to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And then we get eternity after that. We're going to get a little taste of heaven through the time of Jacob's trouble. Going to be up there, you know, watching the Lord take care of things and do stuff. And I mean, that's going to be wonderful. Then we get to marriage, you know, the Lamb. And the Lord comes down and looks at this wicked, evil world and he says, okay. Here's this big army come out here to destroy the few Jews that remain. I'm going to come in, save the day, you know. And, uh, hey, bride, watch this. 200 million man army. He destroys it with his words. Hmm. I wonder where the devil got the idea of using words to destroy. Um, probably got it from the Lord. This book can bring you eternal life. This is the book of life. I'm holding right here in my hands. This book will bring you life. Or it can bring you death. This book can get you to the resurrection of the living. Or it can get you to the resurrection of the dead. It's up to you, really. I pray that you make the right decision. That's going to be it for this study of Revelation chapter 20. I hope that you've been challenged. I hope that uh, the Lord has blessed you in the reading of His Word. And we'll see you in the next study.